Allahu Akbar. For me to talk about an aspect of communication and unity amongst Muslims, and that is how you and I, how we disagree with one another. You know, Brother Naeem, there's a, uh, a common expression that I've been using this expression from the time that I first entered into Islam a few decades ago now. And that was that that particular time I was saying maybe there were close to a billion Muslims in the world and each year or whenever the, the census went up, I would raise the number. So now I'll say that there are 1.6 to 1.7 billion Muslims on this earth. And there are 1.6 or 1.7 different opinions on any singular topic that we may have. That on anything, whether we're talking about where, how you hold your hands, do you cover your heart? Do you hold them to your side? Is it above your navel? What is the length of your pants, the, your, your beard? How do you wear your beard, your mustache? There are 1.6 to 1.7 different opinions about any aspect of Islam. And <clears throat> it's not necessarily a very uh, wrong, a damaging quality amongst this ummah. But so I want to just talk a little bit about how do we disagree? How do we present ourselves with one another? When we find that we disagree, we feel that our delil, that the evidence that we have on any particular subject is so profound that we can't possibly entertain an idea that someone else's opinion may be equally correct. So I want to just take a few minutes to discuss this particular phenomena. One of my daughters, and it's actually my middle daughter, I think I could give her recognition of being someone who just loves the art of debate. Even from a little child, she always loved to debate. No matter what I would say to her, or her mother would say to her, she would always come back with some uh, contrary point that was supposed to be equally valid. And at one point in my Muslim life, I can almost say, without any exaggeration, especially when I was younger, that my middle daughter inherited that quality from me. Because I was also one of these people that no matter what was said, I would come with some contrary point. I wanted to read Islamic history in a way that I could come forward with some kind of evidence that I felt that this person that I'm talking to had not thought about before because they didn't have this particular piece of information. But I want to talk about how important it is for you and I, whenever we're engaging one another on whatever the topic or the subject may be, for us to enter into this discussion at a level and at a point where we are recognizing that unlike those who are not a part of this ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that whenever we open our mouths Whenever we are talking to one another, we're talking to a group, that there's a much higher purpose that we should have in our speech. That there should never, not just during the month of Ramadan, when we try to remind ourselves that I want to cleanse my tongue, I don't want to backbite, I don't want to slander, I don't want doing these fasting hours to just sit around and stand around and just have this useless, frivolous conversation. That even though that sensibility is heightened during the month of Ramadan, every time we open our mouths, we should guard our tongues in a way that whatever I say, that I'm trying to enrich my own remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whoever I'm talking to, I want them to benefit from my speech as well. So even when I find myself in a disagreement with my brother or my sister, I'm not just going to revert 
and have as my default movement a move that I'm trying to just out debate. I'm trying to come up with some kind of argument that would make me appear that I'm smarter or I'm brighter or that I'm more clever than the person that I'm talking to. Even if what we're talking about may be the Quran, it may be the Sirah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu it may be Hadith, it may be fit. But if you and I are not careful, we can bring the same common attitude about speech and even talking about Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. We can bring this attitude of I'm just going to just keep talking to I talk you down. I'm going to show you how smart I am, how clever I am. Brothers and sisters, I want to just throw out a few things for your consideration. And the first one is that, as I referenced, that this disagreement amongst this ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, that if this disagreement is for the purpose of trying to get the best understanding that we have of this deen that when we have this pure intention that it's good as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu has encouraged us and let us know that it's good when we have legitimate disagreements about this thing called Islam, this book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala this sirah, these hadith. It's good when we have knowledge-based disagreements. That one of the distinguishing characteristics and qualities that you and I have, that many of our non-Muslim brothers and sisters do not have at this particular moment, is that everything that we say about Islam Everything that we do should have a basis in this deen. It, we should not just talk about Islam. Let me give you a quick example. In the community mosque of Winston-Salem, we have, when I have discussions with certain brothers in the mosque, like my brother Ibrahim, my brother and friend here, Ibrahim, we have, uh, oftentimes, we keep it light. We talk about important things, but we, we keep it light, light. And in keeping it light, when a brother says something to me and s quoting what he claims to be a hadith, and I ask them, well, is this from the bubble collection? This can't be Sahih Bukhari or Sahih Muslim. It must be from the Sahih of Baba. This is Baba's hadith. And so we may disagree about a hadith and the authenticity of the hadith, but it's not in a disagreeable manner. And so it's in a way that we can accept these points of disagreement without getting disagreeable with one another. Excuse me. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> brothers and sisters, let me just give a quick, few quick examples and I'll get out of your way. If I were to say, and this is, uh, I mean, if it, it sounds outrageous, but if I were to say to you that even the angels had disagreements that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has informed us that even the angels may have disagreed over how they should follow out the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Would this be a true statement or would it be from the hadith of Baba? It's true. It's true. It's very true. There are a number of examples. I'll just give one quick one and, and move on. When in the hadith, in authentic traditions, where we have the narration about the man who was basically a serial killer, he had killed 99 people, and then he went to the abbot, to the worshiper, a sincere worshiper, and he said that I want to get away from this life. 
What can I do? Is there any hope for me? And the worshiper just, the Abba just told him, no. 99, you're, you're a serial killer. You're a murderer. How do you think there's some kind of hope for you at this point? So the man killed him. So now he has a solid 100 notches on his belt. Killed 100 people. So now the brother, go, this man, goes to an alum. He goes to a knowledgeable brother about the faith and he tells him his story. I've killed all of these people. Is there any hope? And this alum told him, yes, there's hope for you, but it's no hope if you stay in this town. Go to this next town. You know the hadith better than I. Go to this next area. There are people there who are trying to do righteous things. Go over there. And then there's some hope for you. So the man said, oh, this is what I needed to hear. And he started out and he's going to the next town and he dies before he gets to the next town. And so the angel of punishment and the angel of mercy, the ones to take this soul, they come down and they're having a disagreement. They're following the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take the soul. But who's going to get the soul? These are the malaika of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this angel of punishment and this angel of mercy have this disagreement. But how did they solve it? They referred it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was not just a random debate that if we want to find out what should we do, we have a legitimate arguments for, for two things. How do we solve it? We must refer it back to the book of Allah, refer it back to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu so you know the end of the story. So they were told what you do, you measure the distance from the town that he's coming from and the town that he was going to and whichever town he was closest to, that would be the one. If he's closer to where he killed 100 people, Angel of punishment, take this dude. He's a mass murderer. He's closer to the town where he's trying to escape this behavior. The angel of mercy, take this person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stretched the earth so by one hand's length, one hand span, he was closer to this town that he was trying to go to. So the angel of mercy took his soul. Even the angels had to refer if there was a disagreement in carrying out the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they had a righteous source they knew how they could make the right determination how their decision could be proper and correct let me go through just a couple of the quick things during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu you know better than I that there were many instances during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad and I'll maybe only give just two quick ones, <clears throat> where you and I know that the Prophet Muhammad had a decision or an opinion about a course of action and that some of the Sahaba, those that he would held their opinion in high esteem. That some of them would say, I think you should take this course of action, and others would say, take that course of action. So many instances from the Sira uh, literature. <clears throat> One of them was this, this dispute about what do we do with the prisoners of war after the Battle of Badr. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and Abu Bakr as siddiq and a group of the Sahaba said that what we do, many of them are the nobles of Mecca. Their families have deep pockets, so let's ransom them. And we can get a lot of money from these prisoners of war. Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu, and others said, no, we need to kill every one of them. Because if you let them go back, you're going to see them on the battlefield again. You defeated them on the battlefield, so kill them right here, right now. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu went with the opinion of get ransom, seek ransom 
from these prisoners of war. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala corrected the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and let him know that what Umar and others who were saying that you should kill them at this point, not out of vengeance, not out of wrath, but because you haven't thoroughly subdued the land yet. It's not time right now to take prisoners of war. It's time for you to subdue to a certain point, and then you can stop the, the uh, conflicts, uh, disagreements with Sahaba, and I'll be done here in a second. Disagreements even amongst the Sahaba. There was this very famous disagreement that after the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam made the Isra and the Mirage, his night journey <clears throat> from Mecca to uh, to Jerusalem and then up into the heavens, the mirage that Abdullah ibn Abbas said that the Prophet Muhammad sallam, saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heavens and had conversation and dialogue with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heavens. And so Aisha <clears throat> the wife of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that when she heard that Ibn Abbas had said that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his own eyes, she's reported to have said, it made my hair stand up. That it's no, I can give you the delil for it, there's no way that Muhammad وسلم, saw with his own eyes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You could not get more authoritative tafsir other than from Ibn Abbas and Aisha radiallahu anhu. And so disagreement amongst the malaika, amongst the angels, thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Disagreement. I thought you were just leaving. I thought you were just, I don't want to hear no more of this stuff. I ain't listening to no more of this. I'm gone. But alhamdulillah, you, you restored my, my, my faith and confidence in you. Alhamdulillah. Uh, but so disagreement, depending upon how, what we do, if our intentions appear, why are we even talking? Why am I running my mouth? Why am I talking? Why am I disagreeing? Am I disagreeing to try to get the best understanding that can possibly be had? Because if you and I are disagreeing about a subject, it means that those who are listening to this disagreement, it means that you and I in our disagreement are hearing different opinions. And all of these opinions can be authentic, can have authority. So through this disagreement, we are enriched in our personal knowledge. And those who may be listening are also enriched just because of a disagreement that we have. If our objective is to get to the truth, get to the haq, what is the real truth about this issue? If that objective is to get to the truth, then disagreement in this circumstance is something that is good. Brothers and sisters, I'll close on this particular note. <clears throat> and that is that the unity that can come from even disagreements that we may have with one another and others. That this is something that is so special, it's such a special blessing and benefit to this ummah that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has given us a dua that could remind us that it ain't just about me, I'm not just concerned 
about my guidance. I'm not just concerned about how I will benefit from whatever is being presented. But I'm concerned about my brothers and sisters as well. As Brother Naeem has said, that the love that we feel for our family members and the love that we feel for our brothers and sisters is incomparable to any other kind of affection and love that one group of people can have for another. The love that we should have for one another as believers should be a part of every discussion that we have. Don't ever forget that this person that I'm debating with, the person that I'm disagreeing with, this is a person that I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward them with Jannah. I want Allah to reward them with the best understanding of this deen and this little short part of a doer. Let not our hearts deviate after you have guided us, but grant us mercy from your own presence. As-salamu alaykum.